Good morning, Highland Church. Morning. And good morning to those who are joining us online in their travels. We trust that while they're traveling, they're watching us too. I actually heard somebody tell me that they were traveling, and so they missed my last sermon. So when they were painting, they listened back to it. And they can now, when they look at a certain section of the wall, they know what I was saying during that time. So, um, so it's available for, for everybody. Um, if you're visiting us tonight, I know we've had some visitors and also some new people, new families moved in here. We're super happy to have you all here. And um, we would love to be able to connect with you. In the pew in front of you is a card that says, Welcome. You can just fill that out, give it to Pastor Benji or myself, or put it in the offering uh, collection container out there in the foyer. And um, we'd love to connect with you. Also, keep in mind that at the end of our praise time, you'll be invited to bring your prayer requests forward. And there's some prayer cards in the pew in front of you. You can go ahead and fill those out. I always encourage people to do it ahead of time so that when, it, when our sister here calls for them, they'll be ready and you can bring them forward and what we do is we send those out to all of the elders and they pray for them throughout the week. We have some, a little bit of business to take care of, uh, uh, some people transferring in and transferring out. So we'll start with those who are transferring out. Todd Parrish is transferring to the Ottawa Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Danny Morris is uh, uh, transferring, uh, I'm sorry, we're not trying to get rid of you, Danny. Danny Roth, Danny Roth is transferring. We're gonna keep Danny Morris over here. Danny Roth is transferring to the Collegedale Community SDA Church also in, um, in the Chattanooga area. Is there a motion to transfer those people out? Second, all right, and second. All in favor? All right, any opposed? All right, and then coming in, we have Laura and Richard Chase. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture for them here but they are transferring in from Milwaukee Northwest SDA Church into our church here. Is there a motion to welcome them in? Second? All right, everybody in favor say welcome. welcome. All right, you're official. Now, this week we were going to be having a picnic potluck out in the pavilion. And then somebody turned the heat up and the rain on. So, fortunately, we have a beautiful building here, so we're going to have our picnic potluck right over here in the Fellowship Hall. Same picnic foods, a little bit better air conditioning, and if you really are diehard and you want to be outside, you can take a plate outside and you can roast out there as far as I'm concerned, but I'm going to be inside with the air conditioning. So please stay around for potluck. If you're visiting us today, stay anyway, and, and even if you didn't think to bring something, stay and we would love to be able to uh, fellowship with you right over here immediately after the service. This Thursday night, TNT, is our 4th of July celebration. We shouldn't call it 4th of July celebration because it's the 6th of July. It's our Independence Day celebration, put it that way. And so we're going to be having a picnic out at the pavilion. We haven't changed that one yet. <laughs> and in theory... The goal is there will be a fireworks presentation after dark that night put on by Signature Healthcare. Now, I have tried to confirm with them in the last couple of weeks and have not succeeded at that. That doesn't mean that they're not doing it. It just means I haven't been able to get a hold of the person who would confirm it. So you may want to plan to stay late till after dark to watch the fireworks. Um, but in the meantime, bring picnic food. We'll just have a good time hanging out together, playing together, you know, all that sort of things that you if, you, if you have any lawn games you like to bring, feel free to bring those. What's that little game where you throw the ball and you, you try to hit the other ball? Bocce ball. ball. That's a fun game. Um, so if you have stuff like that, bring it out and we'll have a good time. Starts at 6.30 on Thursday. And the other thing I want to recognize, uh, mention to you, if you look in your bulletin, we've got a few save the dates. Instead of mailing you a save the date card, here it is in your bulletin. We have, we're going to be having a couple of short weekend seminars coming up. October 7th will be uh, Fostering Spiritual Friendships. And that'll be a Sabbath afternoon. It'll be after our fellowship meal. 
will be sharing how do you make turn your, turn your friendships into spiritual friendships. And then October 27, we're going to have one called Bible Paradigm, talking about how to study the Bible. Pastor Benji will be doing that. Is that going to be a two-night one? It'll be two weekends. So it starts October 27th, and the second one is the next weekend. And then our big one is starting on February 8th. D. Casper will be doing an evangelistic series here, and it will be a 10-day event, but it's not 10 days in a row. Um, there's a couple breaks in there. It'll be a 10-day event. D. Casper will be coming in, and the theme will be a little bit different. It will be an evangelistic meeting to bring your friends to, but it's not going to be directly prophecy-related. It'll be about lifting up Jesus. So that will be on February the 8th. So put those on your calendar. We hope that everybody will participate in those. Well, it seems like we've had plenty of announcements. Let's stand for our opening prayer, and then please remain standing for our opening hymn which will be um, leaning on the everlasting arms. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together this Sabbath, for bringing us through the storms, and we pray now that you would send your presence here with us. Fill each one of us as we are your temple, and let us be full of your Holy Spirit. Clear out the distractions, the clutter, so that we can focus on you today and, and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. in life, arms. Uh, brothers and sisters, today um, our, our offerings, it's going to our local church budget. And this is the, the time that we get to uh, worship together with God. All of us get to participate uh, throughout the week. You can give online. You can give at, um, let's see, here's the website, highlandadventist.org slash give, or you can mail it or after the worship service, you can actually drop it off in the mailbox there. And we give um, because we want to worship God. We give because we have a gratitude inside of our heart, because God created us and God loves us. Um, and that's the way um, we ought to have a, a heart of just gratitude when, when we give. Our local church budget, you guys feel kind of cool right now, right? Our AC is running, and it's running really good. That's where our local church budget goes to our offerings. Um, we're able to, to worship in a, in a good atmosphere here in a, a beautiful church building. Uh, we have so many ministries that they are actually benefiting from your tithe and offerings, from your offerings. So I just want to encourage all of you to continue to be um, um, just good stewards 
of what we have, and also those that are, are perhaps struggling or here and there, trust in God. He will, he will find a way. God always provides. Let's pray. Precious Lord, thank you so much for life. Thank you for the rain that we have been able to get from you. Uh, I pray, Father, that, that you be with these offerings that are going to be given, uh, that you bless them, Lord, and that you help us as a church to be uh, wise and to be good stewards of how to spend them. And we thank you, Lord, that a lot of things are coming up, like evangelistic meetings and how to study the Bible. And all these things matter because we want to grow. So all these funds go to, the, to that. We ask that you be with those uh, that cannot give. Father, we ask that you continue to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. And then at this moment, our little ones, we have our children's um, story coming up, and our little ones get to participate as well. If you have our, any loose, um, you know, dollars or $5 bills or whatever it may be, you can give them to our little ones, and that, that offering goes to our children's ministry here in our local church. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. We had a really big storm last night, didn't we? God had protected us through that night, and which I will be talking about today is God is always protecting us. I have a really good story that will re relate to this topic. About seven years ago, me and my mother were heading on vacation before we go, any we go anywhere on our trip. We always pray to God that he will protect us on our way there. So we left on our vacation, and it was a nice drive. We went through Tennessee. It was nice. We went through Alabama, a little bit of Alabama. It was nice. Until we hit Mount after Mount Montgomery, a little bit after Mount Montgomery, there was a huge storm, lightning, thunder. It was pouring down rain. Well, we were just driving through the storm, and my mother was driving through the storm, and it was a nice storm. It wasn't so bad, but a truck decided it was hydroplaning, and it started sliding and sliding and sliding. It almost hit us, but it didn't hit us, and then it started to tilt, and it rolled, 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 and it rolled into a ditch. A few seconds later, I look back, and it's on fire. So that day, God had protected me and my mother's life. But it wasn't just our lives that were protected. It was everyone that was on that interstate. If God had not protected us, it would have been a whole lot worse situation if he had not protected us. What I'm trying to say is God is always protecting you. Even if you don't know it, he's always protecting you. 
because he cares for you and he loves you and he will do anything to protect you. Have a great Sabbath. of our uh, camp meeting. <laughs> These are the Kababayans. The Kababayans in Filipino means um, fellow citizens or countrymen. <laughs> so these are my fellow Phil American friends from Madison area. They came here to join the praise team today. So I want everybody to sing praises to the Lord today, not just us, right? Just like camp meeting, okay? And so um, <clears throat> I would like actually for us to uh, on the last verse, uh, I'm going to let you know, to stand up because this is like a full, uh, well, actually, I'll let you know when, which song it will be, but how many of you grew up with the Heritage Singers? <laughs> okay, well, we did, so it's an oldie but a goodie. All right, let's do it. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him all day long. Oh! 
I invite the ladies to sing this part, and then the band will sing on the next part, or all uh, join together.
day you've set aside. Please bless us as we come together. Please forgive us our mistakes since we were last here. Forgive us our fears. Take these things, put them away, never to be remembered. Empty us of our self, our selfishness. Fill us with your goodness through your Holy Spirit, through your own methods. Fill us with Jesus. I have in my Bible prayer requests that have been brought down. There are many, many more, many requests, many burdens, many needs, many concerns, even fears. You know each one. And we know from your word that we can trust you to guide us, to give us courage, and to give us what is best for us. As the Bible says, we believe. Please help our unbelief. Be with our pastor as he brings your word to us as he opens your word to us. Help us to understand and to leave this place sharing this message and your love with others. That's why we're here. Please help us to be faithful in that. Bless us through the coming week. Thank you for that unspeakable gift, your son Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading will be found in Judges 2, verses 1 and 2. 
Now the angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to Bolkan. He said, I have brought you from the land of Egypt and led you into the land I had solemnly promised your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, but you must not make an agreement with the people who live in this land. You should tear down the altars where they worship, but you have disobeyed me. Why would you do such a thing? Turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. We're starting a new sermon series uh, on the book of Judges. 
And the sermon series is called Broken Saviors. And I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to read through the book of Judges. It's not the happiest of books to read through. In fact, as you read through, you as a reader are to get very uncomfortable. In fact, as you read through the book of Judges, you're to gain an understanding of what happens when you don't do what God has asked you to do. And as the book of Judges unpacks, it, it starts in the very beginning with the death of Joshua. Joshua, the, the children of Israel, here's a synopsis real quick. Uh, the children of Israel had, had gotten into the promised land, the, flan, the land flowing with milk and honey, and had it solved all their problems. Not at all. In fact, it was only the beginning of their problems. And and the children of Israel, as Joshua, we we sang the song this morning. So uh, thank you, choir, for doing that. As for me and my house, we will serve what? The Lord. That's Joshua saying, like, he was was going before God and he was saying, listen, I cannot take Moses' like, I can't take his place. And God said, hey, listen, I'm going to be with you as I was with Moses And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, that's that's the the hope and prayer that we all have as families. I know for me and my house, that was a a, a very common thing that we wanted to, to show to our kids. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Over and over again we did this. But Josh, the, the book of Joshua comes, and in and, and, and chapter 1, you can read it right there. Joshua dies. Judges is broken up into three main sections. The first part, it tells you, hey, Joshua's going to die. But this is, this is what happens after Joshua died. And there's a bunch of names. Lucia, you did a great job of reading some of the names. But there's a bunch of names of people and these Canaanites and Bezerek. And, and most of us, we fly through this because we're like, listen, I don't even know how to say that name. And over and over again, if you read that first chapter, it just tells you, that God had given them this land. God had given them this land. God had given them this land. It's all this focus on the land. And they were supposed to drive out the Canaanites and all of these different ites. And, but it says, but they did not drive out all of them completely. They did not do everything God had asked. Over and over again, it goes through each tribe. Manasseh, Ephraim, Asher, Naphtali, all Dan, all of them are getting shade thrown at them in chapter one. It's like a genealogy list that you don't want to be a part of because the author of the book of Judges is laying down some serious shade of saying these are the people that were supposed to do what God was, was telling them to do, but they didn't do it. And here is where we're at. We find ourselves at the end of that scenario. And in chapter 2, verse 1, the angel of the Lord, you can read with me, went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said to them, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break this covenant. But it goes on, it says, and you shall make no covenant with inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But, the angel says, But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? So now I say I will not drive them out before you. They shall become thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words, all of the people of Israel, read there, the people lifted up their voices and wept. My bad, we weren't doing what you were do- telling you to do. It's like your parents whenever they came in, and I've said this before. I looked at my, you know, my, when my sister and I were fighting, and my parents would come in and say, stop it now. And we'd look up at our parents, and they'd say, now you apologize to each other. I'm sorry, and I mean it. And your parents would look at you and say, no, you really mean it. I'm sorry. And you do it in the best way because you've been caught. There's no true heart transformation. There's not reconciliation. It's like you've just been told you got your hand caught in the cookie jar and now there's going to be consequences to these actions. And you're like, listen, I, I don't want those consequences. So they wept, it says, and they called on the name of the Lord. And the name was Bochum or Bochum, and it means weepers. 
and they sacrifice there to the Lord. You see, it sounds like they got their stuff together, but it doesn't. Because that's all they did was weep and offer sacrifices. Verse 6, when Joshua dismissed the people, the, the people of Israel went to each his inheritance to take possession of the land. But read verse 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord Yahweh, the God of their fathers, and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went on after other gods, among the, the gods of the people who were around them. They bowed down to them. They provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord. They served the Baals and Asherahs. So anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. He sold them into the surrounding. And you see here, the, the author of Judges is laying down what the book of Judges is going to be at. He's saying, this is why the Judges come. And if you read from Judges 1 to the end of Judges, it does not go well. By the way, I'm here to tell you this, that when we're going to read through, there is some good parts of the book of Judges. But in no way are you to walk away from the book of Judges thinking these Judges are good people. You see, God is making consolations as he tries to bring his people back to him and to the purpose why he was brought them into the land. God makes consolations. It starts out okay, and we're going to read about these different judges, not all of them, so I encourage you to go read the rest of the book of Judges. But as you go, each judge gets just a little bit worse. Until the very end of the, the book of Joy, Judges, spoiler alert, sorry if you don't like the ending. The book of Judges says, and each did what was right in his or her eyes. It sounds like the days in which we're living in. It sounds like the time in which we're living in, in the fact that like, you cannot make a stand for anything because if you do, then you're going to offend or, or, or you're going to cause judgment on people. Or even worse, you're going to make it sound like you need to work your way into heaven if we ask you to watch or to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God. Scripture is full of this idea of a covenant agreement. And yes, we are saved by grace. I'm here to tell you, church, we are saved by grace. The, by the way, Israel was saved by grace. There's no difference. Israel was Exodus brought out of Egypt, not because they did anything. They hadn't agreed to any covenant. God, re God restored them, brought them out without making the covenant. He saved them. We are saved by grace. We are brought out of our own Exodus story. But then we all have our Sinai moments where we're standing in the presence of God and God asks you, now you know who your Yahweh is. You bear his image. Will you bear his name? That's the covenant agreement. That's that moment where we stand before God and agree to say, listen, I, I choose grace. I choose what you've done for me. Now, let me walk in that manner. Let me see the fruit of what that looks like. Because as some scripture says, you can't say you walk in light, but walk in darkness. But people are like, no, 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 that sounds like works, pastor. And I'm here to tell you, listen, we're going to get into that this morning a little bit. But, but there was a covenant agreement. And, and in this, let me, let me say this. Here, here's, here's something you need to know. This is what you need to upload into your brain as we, as we read the book of Judges. And by the way, the whole Old Testament is filled with this language. In fact, the New Testament is filled with this language. In fact, in Genesis 1 and 2, it's filled with this language. The land becomes the focal point of the covenant. The promised land reconnects the cursed earth and the promised Eden. Now sit in that for a second. If you read Genesis to, to the end of the Old Testament, you get this idea that the promised land was a big deal, right? Right? And not just because it was flowing with milk and honey. Evidently, Israel was not vegan. That has nothing to do with that. That language is language reminding you that the promised land was 
in the image of Eden. That, that the promised land, and, and as you read, it goes back to what God had made a covenant to Abraham. God had promised him to do something because he says right here in Judges chapter 1, he says, I, I have given the land into his hand. I have given you this land. Over and over again in scripture, there's this idea that God has given his people this land. In fact, in Leviticus 25, 23, God says this. It's just this random law that comes out of nowhere. And if you, if you, if you read through, you'll, you'll miss it. It says, the land shall not be permanently sold. For the land belongs to me, God says. For you are guests and residents with me, he says. Follow that. Just for a second. Follow that. He says, you're not to sell this land, the promised land, because I have given you it, but in giving you it, you have entered into a covenant agreement to say that understand that it is actually not yours, that it's mine, and you are residents there abiding with me. And so it becomes what Eden was meant to be. It becomes the place where people would meet God. And over and over again, Scripture makes it very clear that the land was the focal point of this covenant. But you have to understand, it, it's, it's insufficient, insufficient simply to say that the Lord gave the land to Israel without taking into consideration the context of the gift which was the covenant relationship and its reciprocal commitments. Do you follow that? In other words, that you, the second you accepted this covenant, there was commitments that you agreed to make. Are you following me, church? The second you accept Jesus as your Savior, you are saved, but you are making a commitment to the covenant of the expectation of what it looks like to be a saved person. And Israel had entered into that covenant. Israel had said, yes, we agree to this. And understanding that the land wasn't ours, what was the land for? Was it just for agriculture? No, no, no. If you go, turn in your Bibles real quick. Turn in your Bibles. Let me give you the Bible verse. It would help, right? Um, turn in your Bibles to, to Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. And Genesis chapter 18, verse 17, there, God has come down and he had told Abraham, hey, hey I'm going to make you a great nation. And remember the covenant he made with Abraham, because that was the original covenant that, that he had made with Abraham. He said, hey, I am going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to actually bless others through you. And we're going to come back to that. Put a pin in that, that he's going to bless others through you. Because here is where he continues to unpack what that means and why the land meant so much to God and the children of Israel. Follow me. I know it's a lot. Just follow me this morning. In, in, in verse 17, the Lord said, shall I hide? Hide from Abraham what I'm about to do. Now, now, what's interesting about this Sodom and Gomorrah story, the, the angels and God has come down and they're sitting there talking. Abraham is, is there and it seems like Abraham hears what God says. And he's like, hey, by the way, he's talking to his other angel friends. He's like, hey, by the way, read it. Shall I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? And Abraham's standing there going, what, what, what are you going to... I, hello, I'm here. <laughs> Have your parents ever done that? Or, you know, when they, they start to spell out when you couldn't spell, hey, should we give the kids I-C-E space C-R-E-A-M? We as parents do that. We spell, and all of a sudden they figure out how to spell, and then we're like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Leave the room. <laughs> and here, God asks, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And he's about to tell Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But read right here, verse 18. He tells what Abraham was meant to do in the land of promise flowing milk and honey. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. See, how shall they be blessed in him? Is it just about the idea of the Messiah? Is it just about this? Or there's something more. And I want to tell you here in, in Genesis, there's something more. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For, verse 19, for I have chosen him that he may command his children 
and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. And here, read what it says. By doing righteousness. By, by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he had promised to him. There, there's this text, an intent as you read the Old Testament of the idea that Abraham, in going to a place not yet known to him, and, and becoming a, a, a father of many nations, and, and having offspring like the sands of the sea, that God was blessing them. And before you walk away and think that God is just playing favorites, he tells you what he was doing that for, because that nation, that tiny nation, that insignificant man that had no unearthly reason to be chosen, becomes a blessing to other people. So God blesses other people by blessing Abraham because Abraham then takes God's blessings and then blesses other people. And church, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're about. That's what the blessings of God go. It's not to look over and say, hey, you have a blessing I don't have, or hey, you got something I don't have, or hey, you get, I want that, or go, hey, look at the blessing I got. Evidently, I'm praying harder than you are. <laughs> It's to understand that everything is God's. All blessings flow from him and are to be given away for him in his name because he wants to bless others through you. That's the covenant agreement. It's to do righteousness and to do justice. It's not to sit there in a church on a hill and say, oh, we've, we've accomplished it. High five, we've done it. We figured out the riddle. Sabbath is the seventh day. No, there's more. There's more blessings that God wants to bestow. While that's an important blessing, and I don't want to diminish that blessing, God has much more of his blessings. And part of the blessings is understanding what God's law does for us. If we live by that, look what it says. He says to Abraham, he says, should I tell Abraham what's going on? He says, because this I know, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. In other words, to walk by the statutes of this covenant. And before you get all high and mighty, say, yes, but Paul says, and Hebrew says, we're a new covenant. Are we a new covenant? Yeah, we're Gentiles. We get in. Because what Jesus did for us. You see, the land was to be the connecting point. And, and what the land was to do was to produce and to be a blessing that the people around would see how these people were living and what they were living, that they weren't buying or selling slaves, that they weren't trying to take everything, that every seven years they would, they would release their servants and every, every 50th year, the year of Jubilee, everything that was sold would return back to its original older, owner and, and, and they were to live by this cycle and they were to live by these blessings and the people around them that had been thrown out, the early prophets, I mean, the later prophets come and say, I'm going to make room for you in the promised land if you live by that same covenant. But you see, there's a commitment to God in understanding what it is. But you see, the children of Israel failed. Over and over again, the prophets, and you can go read some of these, but for example, uh, in, in, in uh, Isaiah, let me just read some of you what, what Israel was doing, because they just did it in Judges chapter 2. The angel of the Lord came and said, hey, you messed up. Oh, woe is us, we're sorry. Offer sacrifices, offer sacrifices. Cut a lot of them in half. David, by the way, when he, when he, when he failed and you know, brought the, uh, the ark in on the ark, uh, the ark in on the ark, the ark in on the cart, and Uzzah reached out, what did he do next? The next time he did it, he did it the way he was supposed to, but every like six steps, he would offer a sacrifice. He's like, let's get this right. But look here, in, for example, Isaiah 1, verse 12. Isaiah 1, verse 12. Watch what he says. 
through the prophet Isaiah about this idea of offering sacrifices. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. You see, Israel was doing what God had told them to do, but they had missed the boat. They had missed the point of what the sacrifices and offerings were due because they were just doing this, this spiritualizing thing and they weren't doing the living out the righteousness and justice. They weren't taking care of the least of these. They weren't taking care of the widows and the orphans. And the least of these, my brother. For whatever you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. But they're offering sacrifices, offering. He says, don't do this. No new moons or Sabbaths. He says, the calling of conviction. I can't endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. God goes off on the very things that he had brought to them and had given them as rituals in this covenant relationship. And he says, I hate them because you're missing the point. You're just coming on this day and then that's all you're doing and you're going out and living your life like the rest. You know, some of us have a second secular life and a sacred life. Oh, come on, pastor. Easy. Because it's Sabbath. We, we got to turn something off and turn on the, the Christian thing, TV, radio, whatever. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be, I do it. But we're like, listen, this is Sabbath. So, so we need to be, this is our sacred day. The other six, that's our secular day. Praise God when that sun goes down. But see, you, the land flowing with milk and honey didn't have an end. It was to be a perpetual living with God in the promised land. That's what he wants. He wants to uh, have us perpetually live in the sacred space. And by the way, not just religiously, in every part of our lives. Over and over again, he says, I hate and despise your feast. Amos, Amos 5.21 says, did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O Israel? I, I, don't, I don't want this. Second, Second Chronicles, I mean, over and over again, all of these texts are, are condemning exactly what, he's like, I don't want your offerings and your sacrifices. In fact, the very verse that we quote when we need something from God God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He can sell some and make us something. Have you ever heard that before? Have you sat in a meeting and maybe quoted that? I have. The Lord could sell some of his cattle and help us build a church. The whole point of that text is on sacrifices and offerings. He says, I have a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your sacrifices. But Judges shows you what happens when we lose focus of the covenant relationship. My wife and I, by the way, for those that didn't know, we had lived in Gallatin for a while. We lived down the hill of the ridge. Trust me, I heard about it from you all. You church members, I love you. I didn't know that was a thing when we moved here. See, when we got the call from the conference, we, we, we called up, and, and I said this story early on, but we called, and we were planning to move a month and a half later. But the moving truck said, hey, listen, there's no other moving trucks available for a long time. The, and we had just accepted the call, and then we got COVID. And they said, we'll be there in two and a half weeks. I said, I'm sorry, what? They said, we can only come get you in two and a half weeks. And then, because everybody was moving out of California. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> wow, I feel the shade. I'm not from there. And... <laughs> And, and so he said, we can come in two and a half weeks. And my wife and I looked at each other, sick with COVID, and we said, we're going to have to pack the house in two and a half weeks. We don't even have a house. And so we said, let's look up on Zillow, what's in Portland, Tennessee. I don't know if Portland has found Zillow. There was nothing here to rent. I quickly called some church members that knew, had no idea who I was, and I said, hey, and everybody, you know, no one had property at the time, and I said, okay, so we found on Zillow, Gallatin knows what Zillow is, and, they, and there was a house for rent, and I called them, and they said, yeah, these things are going, because evidently rent is, it's crazy around here, and the houses were going really fast, and I said, hey, let's see it, so a buddy of mine, Eric Johnson, went over to the house, and, and he, he FaceTimed it with us, sight unseen, I hadn't seen it, he says, this is what it is, it looks fine, I was like, is it real, because I don't want to get it scammed, he's like, it looks like it's real, <laughs> so I, I sent money <laughs> through the internet, 
That's a thing they tell you not to do. And I signed, a, I signed a contract. And we moved into the house in Gallatin. And the moment we moved in, we found out that that's a thing, that you need to live up here. This is the promised land, church. Come on. Amen. My wife and I realized we have made an error. We are the tribe of Dan on the other side of the Jordan. We need to come up. And so, for those that don't know, my wife and I have just moved to Portland, Tennessee, 37148. We heard the call. Now, the reason why I tell you that is not to brag, because when we went to make, to begin the process of buying a house, my wife and I began to pray, and we prayed and prayed and prayed and said, God, show us the house that can be a sanctuary for you, that can be its own little Eden, not for us. And I don't say this arrogantly, but so that other people can feel blessed by God. That whoever walks into those doors or comes onto the property will feel the presence of God, not because of its Cartesian eye, because that this is a sacred spot that God had given us, but he didn't give it to us. Everything is the Lord's. And I remember putting the offer on the, on the house, my first house I bought, now I'm not like some of you older people, not that you're old, that like, you know, it was $20,000 when you bought the house. Ours was 100,000 and I about had a coronary. And I remember signing the contract, I won't tell you how much it is, I'm gonna tell you my address so you can zillow it. But I remember signing the contract, the offer. I was like, Lord, this is, this is. And God told me, it's not your money. It's not your house. And, and we went to make the offer and, and, and the process was terrible because long story short, the person selling the house didn't have legal right to sell. Like we should have got out, right? Like we should have run away, right? I'm looking at somebody who knows what I'm talking about. We should have ran far from this. We had put the offer. They had accepted the offer. We had negotiated. We came into the house inspection. The house inspection went well. And we were getting ready to walk out. And the homeowner looked at us and said, I'm so glad that you guys can be patient on closing. And I was like, what? What, what, what are you talking about? And I looked at my realtor. And I said, what, what's happening? <laughs> what do you mean? We... And they looked... And they quickly made a phone call and they said, yeah, they don't have legal standing to sell the house. In fact, they don't have legal standing to even sell, like, beyond contract. I was like, what does that mean we are? He's like, I don't know. I was like, what do you mean you don't know? We had a good time. And for the next month and a half, I did not know if the house was going to be ours. Because they didn't have legal standing. Back and forth and... And we sat there wondering, God, is this really what you want from us? And, and, and I had to realize that there's nothing I can do. But in this process, I realized that I had to still be faithful. See, here's, here's what the children of Israel failed to do. Failure to honor God in the material realm cannot be compensated for by religiosity in the spiritual realm. Did you catch that? Failure to honor God in the outside is not compensated by how many days you come on Sabbath here. Failure to do righteousness and justice outside isn't compensated by praying harder inside, by doing standing when you're supposed to, sitting when you're supposed to, praying when you're supposed to. That is not compensation for what you do outside. Loyalty, the covenantal loyalty required submission across the whole realm of human life on earth, on the farms as much as on the altar. Judges, the whole book of Judges is showing you what life will look like when all you do is offer sacrifices and offerings. Because here in the book of Judges, and you can read over and over again in Judges, turn in with me, Judges chapter 2. Verse 16, 
This is what the Lord did. The Lord raised up judges to bring his people back because all they were doing is the spiritual realm. And they had forgot about the material realm. They had forgot that the land was supposed to be a blessing to other people, that they weren't supposed to take advantage. They were to completely do what God had asked them to do. And and stay with me, church. We're going to get this, we're going to nail this home. You're like, what does this have to do with anything? Follow me here. And the... Then the Lord raised up judges, verse 16, who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord and did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges from them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of the enemies. There was this cycle. The judge, the people of Israel would lose their way. Judge would come in and bring them back to God, and the people would repent. Offer sacrifices. And then they'd go back to the same everything else. And a judge would come. And the people would repent. And then they'd forget the covenant agreement. And they'd go back to doing what they'd been doing. And they'd be overtaken. And then a judge would come. And the people would repent. Until finally at the end. People did what was right in their own eyes. The cycle of violence in judges is not praising the judges. It's condemning the children of Israel. Connecting this to the New Testament. You see, the Old Testament taught that Israel, in possession of God's land, was to be a blessing to the nations and a connection back to Yahweh. Through the land, through the way the people were living, they were the connecting point back to Yahweh for the nations. And now, but now, post-resurrection, the message is crystal clear. Through the cross of Christ, those who are out are now in. Those who are far off are now near. Those who are excluded now belong. There's this idea that Christ becomes, does what the land in Israel was supposed to accomplish. That is reconnecting the cursed creation back with their blessed creator. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be that. T- turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. We're going to jump around here. Get ready. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. We have reduced this to a health message, and it means so much more. That through Jesus, we are, building, we are being built into a dwelling place for God. Scripture says that. And a dwelling place for God isn't for us to worship in. A dwelling place for God is for the nations to come and find God in. That is what it's for. And over and over again in Revelation, there is a message to go to those who dwell on the earth, for we are dwellers in heaven. And here in in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Paul is talking about this and says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And if if I didn't remind you, I'm going to remind you now. Let me speak it in the southern way. Do y'all not know? Huh? Did you hear that? The difference is not singular, it's plural here. The you is a plural you in the Greek. It is, do y'all not know that your singular body were not a bunch of temples running around? Did you hear that? We're being built into one temple. That's it. Do you not know that y'all's body, y'all's singular body is a singular temple of God? You are not your own. Come on. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Over and over again, it talks about this idea of what Jesus did. Jesus became the land, the connecting point. The promised land is being built back in through Jesus. He is being, he's the cornerstone, scripture says. And we're a part of that building. And so it matters what we do, church. There is a covenant agreement through our salvation. 
Just because it's a new covenant doesn't mean there's no covenant agreement, that there's no reciprocal response to when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God. Here, to become a God, part of God's chosen people requires a covenant relationship and a reciprocal commitment. Paul would call it walking in the manner worthy of the calling of God. James would call it faith whose fruit produced works. The Bible would call it God working out his goodwill and pleasure in you over and over again. Scripture is full of calling us to say, yes, you are saved by grace, but you fool, don't go sinning more so that grace can abound more. I've called you to keep the commandments of God, all of them, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's worship God. That's what you're called to do. It's not to each one of us do whatever we want to do. It's not for each one of us to decide. It's to us to hold to what God has called us to. It's to connect back to, 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 to walking in the manner worthy of the calling of God. That the, by the way, and we did a sermon on this, that the fruit of the Spirit isn't for us. The fruit of the Spirit isn't so that I have love, I have joy, that I get to eat what I bear. That's not, (laughs) you miss it. The fruit of the Spirit are for those outside that need righteousness, that need justice, and maybe for some of us inside. As my wife and I got a call that the The person who had signed the contract legally had the right to sell the house. And a few weeks later, we walked into the closing place. I don't know what it's called. (laughs) The place where you close. That's what we call it. The title. The title company. That's what it's called. I bought and sold a lot of houses. Walked into the title company and we began to sign our names. I remember just looking at my wife afterwards as we we feel like God is asking us to have somebody over or someone has asked to come over we're like yeah but we don't want them and God reminds us it's not your home you don't get to decide my wife and I very early on in our pastoral ministry were reminded by God that it We're not here just to minister to the easy people, to the easy church members, which you all are, (laughs) now that we live in Portland. But that we're here to minister to the difficult ones too, to the ones that are judgmental, to the least of these, to the greater of these. We're called by the grace of God. Paul says, I have become to the Jews like the Jews, to the Greeks like the Greeks, to those under the law like the under the law, those above the law like those above the law. I've become all things to all people so that by the grace of God, we might save some. The covenant relationship that we have with God does not end with God's grace. God is blessing you through his grace so that you, that his grace abounds that much more. In in 1 John 2, 4 to 6, and I'll close with this, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected by this. We may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. God has a promised land, an Eden, that he's trying to reconnect everybody back to because the broken world in which we live in is cursed. From from the very beginning in Deuteronomy, the last last little 
time Moses was standing before his people and he's sitting there and he tells them the commandments and he does all this, he says in, in chapter six, verse one, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going to possess. And he warns them what's gonna happen. And over and over again in Deuteronomy, God says, I've set before you life and blessing, death and curses. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna be a dwelling place, totally committed to the covenant relationship that God is asking you to do? Not deciding what is good or right in your own mind, but relying on him and trusting that his way is the only way. His gospel is the only gospel. There is no other. That he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that in him we are that new creation. Which means if you're a new creation, your dwelling place is a new earth. And you're blessed by God so that you can bless others by what God has blessed you with. Stop hoarding it. Start giving it. Father God, you've called us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God, and that scares some because it sounds like salvation through works. Lord, you've saved us. You brought us out of the, the slavery. You brought us out of darkness. You brought us out of that when you saved us. But you fool, us fools, Lord, doesn't mean we keep on sinning so that grace can abound that much more. That we are called to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of you by keeping your commandments, by meditating on them, by when we stand, when we sit, when we lie down, that we meditate on your commands, Lord that we don't just make it about our religious part of our life, that our religious part of our life becomes every part of our life, that we don't have a sacred and a secular, that all we have is abiding in you and you abiding in us, so that, that this little Eden that you have allowed us to dwell in can bring others in connection with you. This is our prayer and hope in Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord have his face shine upon you and give you peace. Happy Sabbath, church family, and blessings.